following is an R News production in cooperation with the Rochester Red Wings. When you think of local sports, think R Sports. You'll get in-depth profiles of local athletes only on R News. Looking for a great night out on the town at an affordable rate for everyone? Then look no further than fabulous Frontier Field where the Red Wings play. It's as sweet as the cotton candy in the stands. The smell of freshly cut green grass, the aroma of hot dogs in the air, and the roar of the crowd at the crack of the bat. It's all part of the fun at Red Wings Baseball. For nearly 50% off the box office rate, you can enjoy Red Wings season seats at Rochester's best-known diamond, Frontier Field. The casual fan can choose from one of our five-game mini-packs or undated ticket coupon books, all at a reduced rate. And be sure you look like a fan when you come to the ballpark by sporting the hottest logo in minor league baseball. Stop by the Red Wings team store and choose from our wide variety of t-shirts, sweatshirts, jackets, caps, and more. For more information on ticket packages, team apparel, or to schedule a group night out at the ballpark, call 454-1001, 454-1001. Silver Stadium the proper send-off it really deserves this year and uh, this place has been so great to our community and uh, uh, I'm just so happy that, that we were able to put on a show here tonight and have 12,000 plus fans here in the stands cheering on the wings and uh, this just makes it all worthwhile tonight. The first lady of baseball in Rochester, Mrs. Lori Silver. Place. And I used to come to the ball games on Thursday. It was Ladies' Day for free. I, I'll follow them wherever they go because they are a great team. I've had players tell me, and you know, the, the thing that I've known for a long, long time since I've been growing up here, Rochester has the best fans in minor league baseball, and maybe in all of baseball for that matter. And uh, you know, if it weren't for the fans, this place wouldn't be the same. There's no question about it. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll miss them the most. I'm Bill Pucko. Silver Stadium spent the 1997 season alone and abandoned. And by the start of the 1998 season, it'll be just a memory. The time for reminiscing passed. A new tradition began downtown, where the Rochester Red Wings learned to call Frontier Field home and made their first season there one to remember. <laughs> Thank you. 
The new stadium opened for baseball business on Friday night, April the 11th. 13,227 in the stands. The Red Wings and the scranton Wilkesbury Red Barons on the field. Rochester rookie Danny Clyburn drove in the first run at Frontier. B.J. Waskis scored it. Wing starting pitcher Brian Sikinski put in his bid for Hero Honors, taking a no-hitter to the sixth. But a fitting ending wasn't to be. The Barons rallied. Rob Butler's bases loaded triple off Brian Schaus provided the margin of victory for Scranton, an 8-5 winner. Same two teams, two nights later. And Waskis made a little history. Fortunio deals, fastball hit in the air to deep center field. Burton going way back, and this one is over his head and over the wall. A three-run game-winning homer for B.J. Waskis. Six to three, the Red Wings win it as B.J. Waskis hits his first home run of the year, and he gets congratulations at home plate from everybody. I was a little upset. Uh, you know, a, a, a Tommy Davis, is, you know, he's in, hitting in front of me, a good hitter that he is, but he's got 30 at-bats in this league, and I got, you know, 350, you know, and so they're walking him to get to me. That's, that's kind of throwing it in my face. You know, you're a little upset me a little bit. That game was the first of six straight wins for the Wings. On April 24th, pitcher Nerio Rodriguez did some serious flirting with a no-hitter against Norfolk. He took it to the eighth when Sean Gilbert tried to bunt his way on. P.J. Forbes with a bare hand at third, can't get him. The only hit of the day for the Tides in a 1-0 Red Wings win. A seven-game winning streak followed, and Rochester finished the month of April 17-9, first in the I.L. East. Outfielder Danny Clyburn led the way early. He had seven home runs and drove in 19 in April alone. Clyburn wound up with a team-high 20 home runs, a team-high 76 RBI. He started in the AAA All-Star game, where he hit a home run. My perception of Danny in spring training was, uh, you know, not so good early because he was a little hurt in spring training. He was slow moving, uh, didn't exert himself in big league camp, but uh, when he got to minor league camp where he was, you know, felt very comfortable, knew he was going to play in AAA, he started putting the bat on the ball, showing tremendous power, and he came right out of minor league spring training into this season on a very hot streak, a torrid streak, and he carried us for the, for the month of April and, and part of May. The team continued to cook through May. On the 18th, a young catcher named Jim Foster made an auspicious AAA debut against Pawtucket. Foster threw out a would-be stealer had three hits and made like running back Terrell Davis scoring on a play at the plate. None of these guys know me. I mean, the majority of them, a couple of them do, but the majority of them don't know who I am or how good I am. And, um, it's good to come in and do something your first day because then they get to take a look at you and, uh, you know, they know what kind of player you are. Foster was only up for one week but made a great first impression. By June 1st, the Red Wings were four and a half games up on Pawtucket playing Ottawa, trailing in the bottom of the ninth, with Tommy Davis up. Fly ball, deep left field. Back goes Safer, at the track, at the wall, it's good! The Red Wings won it! Tommy Davis with a two-run homer to win the game for Rochester, three to two. That was Rochester's high watermark for the first half. The rest of the month wasn't as much fun. Uh, everything that had, had gone right in April and May uh, just seemed to turn the other way in June. Uh, games that we were winning before, the close games, uh, the one-run games, we'd come back and win late in the game. It just wasn't happening anymore. Particularly distressing were back-to-back -back extra inning defeats to the Red Sox. Tony Rodriguez drove in the game winner off Rod Steff in the 11th of the series opener. The next night in a grueling four and a half hour affair with few left in the stands as the clocks pushed midnight, the Wings lost in 15. Rochester was just 10 and 17 in June. Their lead in the division was gone. 
Then came Arabu. Hideki Arabu created a frenzy wherever he pitched. In his predetermined climb to New York, aside from millions, Arabu was expected to become the far eastern savior of the pinstripes. On June 30th, he pitched against the Red Wings as a new member of the Columbus Clippers. Not all were impressed. I'm a little mad, actually, to tell you the truth. And when uh, they're up there uh, saying uh, it's a Hideki Arabu night, and you know, who's this guy? You know, he has not, not one game in the major leagues. He's just another minor league pitcher right now. Uh, so, you know, I, I'm a little upset that they're treating this guy like he's royalty or something like that. Ain't, we don't have Tony Tarasco night when he comes down or, or, uh, or anybody else who come down from the big leagues. We don't have their night. So, you know, it, this guy ain't even pitched to me in the major leagues. Who is he? He ain't nobody. The season's second biggest crowd, 13,485 came out to see him. And the Wings went to work. P.J. Forbes led off with a base hit. He stole second and came across on Jim Warwick's hit. Rochester scored three runs on three hits and three stolen bases in the first. Rabu settled down, though. Struck out the side in his fifth and final inning, Hideki pitched to a no decision. Rochester rallied in the eighth to beat the Clippers 8-7. For the next month, the Red Wings were close to unbeatable. The game Hideki Rabu pitched, uh, I think if you look at our record after that night, uh, that was a game that we were behind in late in the game after he had come out. Um, had an unbelievable crowd that night. Uh, an amazing night, I think, uh, for this stadium. The number of people, as loud as it was. Um, I said it before, I thought the night was electric here. It's just a, what you dream about, the type of attitude, atmosphere you want to have when you play a baseball game. And uh, I, we were down um, in that game, came back and ended up winning that night, and uh, just kind of snowballed from there in terms of uh, how we played the rest of the year. It shouldn't be the manager figuring everything out for 25 guys. My opinion is the guys need to sit down and we need to figure it out together so we're all on the same page, understanding what we have to do to be successful. We got input from everyone involved. The guys made commitments to uh, get themselves back on track and we went out and kicked somebody's butt that night and it just went right on from there. And, uh, very proud of the job that team did. July 6th against Ottawa. Francisco Matos with a two-run double. Lou Frazier and Jim Warwick scored. Nereo Rodriguez struck out 10 for his first career AAA shutout. The Wings won 5-0. Another day, another hero. Aaron Ledesma, a week shy of a permanent promotion to Baltimore with a run scoring hit and a 10-8 victory over the Lynx. Ledesma hit 325 for Rochester. In a doubleheader sweep of the Red Barons, Lou Frazier scored Davis and Clyburn with a double. The Wings came from a 4-0 deficit to win 6-5. Rochester won eight straight, and starting with a win over Columbus on a Rabu night, took 24 of 30 and never looked back. The rampaging Red Wings broke only for a visit from their most distinguished alumni. Another first place team, the Baltimore Orioles, and their MVP on the field of goodwill, Cal Ripken. Everyone wanted a piece of the future Hall of Famer, and few were left out, it seemed. Ripken has rare respect for the annual exhibition. He played in it on the Rochester side as a Red Wing in 1981. He wanted to do something that uh, was considered positive in the game, so I think the focus you know, for once it starts to turn to more of an individual type thing, even though it's a game, it's a team game, but it's still an individual uh, um, performances that you put together out there. And I, re I just remember trying to do something, putting more pressure on myself to try to do something good in that game. In that game, in 1997, Ripken struck out. Scott Bullitt doubled the left to score Ledesma, and the Wings won 3-1 to take the all-time series lead before going back to work. July 25th through 27, a weekend series of Frontier against the Clippers. Brian Williams gets Tim Barker. Ryan Luzinski cuts down Mark Ronan. The Wings won two of three games, games attended by 31,764, the second largest three-game series crowd in Wings history. Every time we played a home game, we had an advantage over other teams. 
uh, first with the crowds. Um, unbelievable park, park to play in. Uh, one, I've, one like I've never played in as far as minor league baseball goes in terms of the people coming out to the stadium and being into the games and being knowledgeable of the game. Uh, speaks volumes for the city and, and the people that come out every night. Rochester had an eight and a half game lead in early August, primarily due to overpowering pitching. The staff ace at the season's start was Jimmy Haynes. The right-hander led the league in strikeouts in 95 and probably would have again in 1997 had he not been traded to the Oakland A's for a major league bat. Geronimo Barroa. But the Wings didn't miss a beat with Haynes' departure. Rick Krivda stepped up with a career year. One of the best seasons ever by a Rochester pitcher. Krifter went 14 and two. The 14, the most wins by a Rochester pitcher since Mike Parrott won 15, 20 years before. Krifter led the International League in complete games and shutouts. He won his last five decisions before receiving his promotion to the Orioles in late August. Nerio Rodriguez and Esteban Yan were both worthy successors. Yan was 11 and five. Rodriguez threw two one-hitters and won the strikeout crown. Out of the bullpen, Rod Steph saved 14 games. Brian Schaus, another nine. Opposition hitters batted just 191 against Schaus, and he was perfect in the postseason. When you think about it and you go back with Jimmy Haynes and Nuriel Rodriguez, Esteban Yan, Rick Krivda, all the strikeouts that they were amassing, that meant that we weren't having to field a lot of balls. You know, we weren't having to chase a lot of balls in the gap. The pressure wasn't being put on our defense to make mistakes. And if I'm not mistaken, we might have led this league in fielding percentage. And we had a great fielding club. But when you throw in all those strikeouts, we weren't having to make a lot of plays. So, uh, you know, that really helped us uh, win a lot of ball games. On August 21st, Shell struck out the side in the ninth and nailed down a win over Toledo. The next day, the Wings scored six in the bottom of the ninth to win, and the day after, won again to move a season best 31 games over 500. And the fans kept coming. The previous all-time attendance mark fell, and the Wings set their sights on drawing 500,000 for the first time ever. On the last home game of the regular season, August 27th, Larry Wider of Fairport officially became the landmark attendee. I was wondering what the holdup in the line was and why we weren't moving to get in the park. But when they announced that I was a 500th, I couldn't believe it. I, I still can't believe it. The team, meanwhile, went into a tailspin, losing six straight and seven of its last eight games of the year. But the lone victory is monumental. August 31st, the Wings at Syracuse. Tim Laker hit a home run to give Rochester a 2-1 lead over the Sky Chiefs. Rod Steff took over for Doug Johns and nailed the game and the division championship down. Line drive right field. Here comes Bullet on the run. Makes the catch. The Red Wings clinch the International League Eastern Division title with a 2-1 victory over the Syracuse Sky Chiefs. What a year it was. The Red Wings led the Iowa East for the final 56 days of the season. 112 overall, their 83 and 58 record was the league's best, was 10th best among all full season minor league teams. They led the International League with 25 one run victories. The pitching staff led the league in strikeouts, shutouts, fewest hits, and fewest runs allowed. Mar Foley was the manager of the year, honored by the International League, Baseball Weekly, and the Sporting News. But as August became September, it was time to wipe the slate clean for the Governor's Cup playoffs. The playoffs are a whole new season, and uh, I think that taking that attitude into the Pawtucket series, the first series, that it was a new season, it didn't matter that they had, you know, beat us pretty good at their park, you know, that, that's what started it all for us. The Rochester Red Wings lost 12 of the 17 times they played their first round playoff opponent, Pawtucket, in the regular season. It wasn't a good matchup especially at Pawtucket, where the Wings were 1-8. and eight. And Rochester's roster was in flux. Rodriguez was promoted. Three were injured, one released. 
The Wings brought in a free agent, traded for infielder, promoted two from double A, and hoped for the best. Doug Johns, an eccentric, out of work veteran left hander signed in June, was the game one starter. The Wings got him a run in the ninth. Davis with an RBI double. Johns made it stand, pitching his best game of the year, a 1 0 shutout, and the lead in the series, guaranteeing a split of the games at McCoy Stadium. Game two, Pawtucket's Donnie Sadler with the RBI hit. The Red Sox won 4 3. The best of five series was 1 to 1, coming to Rochester. Foley pulled another rabbit out of his managerial hat in game three, starting Dave Pavlis. He last pitched in Japan following his release from Columbus in the spring and was strictly a reliever. Two more newcomers produced. Shortstop Keith Johns, Milwaukee property a week earlier, hit a home run. And outfielder Julio Paguero, a Mexican League refugee, hit a run producing triple. Pavlis, Johns, Paguero, and a 7-1 win with a big assist from the player development director. You know, Sid Thrift, man, my hat is off to Sid. What a dynamic guy to go out and find his players at a moment's notice. He brought in uh, Keith Johns and Dave Pavlis and our center fielder, Paguro. So hats off to Sid. He's as much of our winning as anything, but the guys that he's brought in have stepped up, uh, did the job, and have really carried us through the playoffs. Game four, Julio Moreno on the mound, making his AAA debut. No problem. Moreno worked seven innings, giving up just one unearned run. He got long ball support from Peguero and Laker. Hector Ramirez had the ball last, and he struck out Jason Veritek and by a 5-2 final, put the series to bed in four games. The Red Wings were headed to the Governor's Cup Finals for the third time in the last five years. These guys were hungry. These guys wanted to win. A lot of individual uh, guys on our team that never won before, never gotten a ring. And it was all the talk the last of August, you know, going into September, was how we were determined that we were going to win the championship. First year in the new stadium in Rochester. You know, a lot of guys were playing for the fans. Uh, a lot of close relationships were built between the players and the fans, and, and there was a lot of talk of that. If, if we really wanted to win the championship for, you know, for the city of Rochester. Oh. The championship round was a rematch from the year before. The Red Wings busing to Columbus to play the Clippers. The fans in Columbus support the Clippers well until football season begins. And in deference to Ohio State, it's very lonely at the ballpark. That was the backdrop for the first two games of the Governor's Cup Final. In game one, Rochester's Tim Laker got the green light on a 3-0 pitch with the bases loaded. His fourth inning double scored three. Doug Johns won again, and the Wings took game one 11-6. International League President Randy Mobley with the Wings front office staff among the very few in attendance for game two in the rain. Former wing Clay Bellinger conspired to beat his ex-mates with a run scoring hit. Mike Jerzenbeck bested Esteban Yan 8-4. The series was even. The series would end in Rochester. We knew coming back here that we had the advantage. I mean, it was uh, our park, and, and we had played well all year in our park. And, you know, anytime you can come home even up and you got a best of three series, and, which is what it boiled down to, um, I know myself, I felt like we had the advantage going into the final three games. Manager Marv rolled the dice again in game three and went back to Pavlis, who ironically was still the Clippers' saves leader. His former teammates had to wonder why he was ever let go. Pavlis pitched like a bulldog into the eighth inning without giving up an earned run. The last time I started and went seven innings was 94 when I was pitching in Italy. That was uh, seven innings, no earned runs. When you went out there, d uh, could you have had any way of knowing that you had that much in you? No, I had none. I was just I was hoping to give Marv and the, the ball club uh, four or five strong innings and just keep it close. Forbes continued his stellar season with a third inning homer. Willis Satanez hit one in the fifth. That was all Pavlis and company needed. Chris Bennett got the last out. The Wings won three to one and were one win away from the championship. 7,500 showed up on a Saturday night hoping to see it happen. 
game four, where unlike the Red Sox, the Clippers did not pack it in. In the fourth inning, Mark Ronan with a two-run double pass to diving Atanez gave Columbus a 4-1 lead. But back came the Red Wings. Clyburn's home run in the sixth made it 4-2. Still in the sixth, B.J. Waskis tripled to score Tommy Davis to make it 4-3. But Waskis was stranded at third with a tying run. The Wings loaded the bases in the ninth. Francisco Matos to center. Bellinger hauled it in. Columbus holds on for a nail-biting, series-tying 4-3 win. Sunday, September 14th, the last day of the season. The Governor's Cup on hand, on the line. Jerzenbeck, the Game 2 winner for the Clippers, was opposed by the 20-year-old Moreno, who had polished off Pawtucket eight days earlier. If the kid had nerves, he didn't show it. Striking out slugger Shane Spencer to get out of the first. In the bottom of the first, Rochester scored three times. Clyburn hit a pop fly to right that fell in front of Spencer. Forbes scored. Laker then hit a drive to center. Short hopping the wall and legging out an RBI triple, Clyburn crossed. Davis singled up the middle. The score Laker was three to nothing wings. In the third inning, Clyburn drove in another. Mato scored for a four nothing lead the celebration seemed close at hand. Moreno pitched the wings into the sixth. Lowell reached him for a double in the left field corner. Yvonne Cruz scored to cut the Rochester lead in half, four to two. They added another in the seventh to make it four to three. Foley turned the game over to Brian Schaus in the eighth. With one out in the ninth, Homer Bush tried to bunt his way on. The 1-1 one, one pitch. Bunt attempt. Popped up third base side. Here comes Forbes. He dies. He got it. He got it. Forbes made the catch. Unbelievable. What a play by Forbes. Head first dive, and he just got it. Everything happened so fast. I, I saw his hands, and you just try to react, react to a guy's hands. When, he, when you see his hands move up the bat, and he's going to bunt. Um, I got a good jump on it. and. Uh, you know, I really couldn't tell you anything except I just, you know, threw myself at it, uh, went into my glove. Um, you know, I felt like it was a huge out for the simple fact that if he gets on base, he's on base with one out in the, the tying run, and they got the top of the order coming up. The wings were one out away. Matt Howard, the hitter. Schaus has the sign. He's ready to go. He kicks the one-two pitch. Swing and a fly ball hit the straightaway center field and deep. Back goes Pagaro. He's there. He makes the catch. Yeah, the Red Wings win the Governor's Cup championship. since I was 12 years old, we won the state soccer championship. So I've come close a few times, but I mean, it really was, it, it's so worthwhile. Like, I mean, I don't even feel this being poured out of my head right now. You know, these fans here have been behind us all year long and they stayed with us all game long to the last out here in that whole last inning. You couldn't ask anything more from them. I've been playing for 12 years. This has got to be one of the highlights of my career. With this team, man, they just played together all year, and it's the way it should end. I mean, it came down to five games, and just an awesome year. Hey, you walked the trophy around and made a point to do it. How'd that feel? It was such a nice trophy. I had to grab, you know, watch all those guys with the Stanley Cup and everything, you know. You don't win a World Series, Triple is the next best thing, and it was, it was great. Celebration of Rochester's 10th Governor's Cup was short, but intense. A team truly greater than the sum of its parts. A champion by definition. It means a lot. 
it means the culmination of a great season with the best team personality wise I've ever managed not uh, an overly talented laden club but a bunch of hard workers knew how to play the game unselfish and uh, baseball analysts should take a look at this team and see how the game should really be played because these guys did it day in and day out. The 1997 Red Wings were champions on and off the field. A record 540,872 came out to see baseball at state-of-the-art Frontier Field. The new Red Wings logo had teeth and became one of the most popular and recognized in all of minor league ball. The front office won the Larry McPhail Award for promoting Rochester community baseball better than any other. The team itself proved worthy of promotion. It was put together with character veterans, overpowering pitching, a few quality prospects, and a first-rate manager by an organization that cared enough to win. The end result was a magical season and a story worth retelling. The 1997 Governor's Cup champion, Rochester Red Wings.